Hey guys, Tom Boothelay here. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about the six-step method for 12-lead ECG interpretation. If you like this content, I hope you will uh, like and share and subscribe to my channel. So this video presupposes that you have some familiarity with the cardiac cycle, so the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave, and that you are familiar with the 20 or so basic heart rhythms. So we're getting into 12 lead ECG interpretation here. And we're going to start with a normal 12 lead ECG, and there's a couple reasons for that. First, probably because the limited amount of time that we have in medical education, whether you're in medical school, nursing school, paramedic school, we tend to focus a lot on pathology, and everyone wants to get to identifying coronary ischemia and things like that. And so believe it or not, the normal 12 lead ECG is somewhat of a ne neglected topic in education. Also, there's a second reason, and that is it has been said by people a lot smarter than me and only partially in jest that normal is the most difficult diagnosis in medicine. If you think about it, no one wants to be the one to say that someone is normal, but someone who is, for example, suffering health anxiety, that is exactly what they need to hear. And so if you're not confident that you really understand normal, it's going to be kind of difficult for you to identify abnormal. And so that is why we're starting with the normal 12 lead ECG as we run through the six-step method. So this is the six-step method. It starts with rate and rhythm. So we're always going to start there with a 12 lead ECG. And then we're going to look at axis determination. Now, this is often the time in a class that someone's eyes glaze over and they start to experience their own anxiety. Um, access determination just brings that out in folks, but don't worry. We're going to do a whole separate video on cardiac access determination today. So the purpose today is just to kind of show you what, um, maybe not an expert electrocardiographer, but someone who is very familiar with an organized approach to ECG interpretation, um, the steps that they might follow. So after rate and rhythm and axis, we're going to look at intervals. Now, some of this overlaps a little bit. You might pick up some of these things as you're looking at rate and rhythm, um, but, but this is our designated time to go and specifically look at the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT interval. So we'll focus on that on step three. Next in step four, we're gonna look at morphology. In particular, when supraventricular rhythms are wide, we're going to try and differentiate them into right or left bundle branch block uh, or an interventricular conduction defect, something like that. And then in step five, uh, we're going to rule out some of the mimics of ST segment elevation or some of those conditions that cause ST segment other than acute myocardial infarction on the 12 lead ECG. And then finally, in step six, we're going to look for ischemia, acute injury, and infarct. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, there's a seventh step to the six-step method, and there is, and that is correlate to history and clinical presentation. Just having taught 12-lead ECG interpretation so many times, I'm always reminding students to correlate to the history and clinical presentation, and so uh, one day someone just raised their hand and said, why don't you just make that step seven? And I said, actually, that's a really good idea. Um, so I do kind of think of that as step seven, uh, but I still call this my six-step method for 12 lead ECG interpretation. So let's go ahead and start with rate and rhythm. And again, we're going to use a normal 12 lead ECG today. So here we go. Uh, this is a 26-year-old male. And you'll notice at the top of this ECG, we have some computerized measurements. And if you look, the computer is measuring the heart rate at 68 beats per minute. Well, normal sinus rhythm uh, by convention, we say is 60 to 100 beats a minute. So that is a normal heart rate, but we always wanna confirm things with our own eyes. So if we go back and look at this ECG and we look for an R wave, um, well, first of all, this works for regular rhythm. So the first thing I want you to notice when you look at this 12 lead ECG, just, you don't need to use calipers here. Just kind of get an intuitive sense for wh whether or not this is a regular or irregular rhythm. You'd look at this and you'd say, well, it's regular. 
when you have a regular rhythm on a 12 lead ECG, you can kind of look and use what we call the large block method to see if you agree with the computerized um, calculation of the heart rate. So if we look for an R wave that kind of lines up on one of the large block, one of the lines from a large block, we can see that kind of happens here in lead uh, V1. So if we focus on that and kind of blow that up, and we kind of call that ground zero there, we can count one, two, three, four uh, large blocks in between these cardiac cycles, and, you know, four or five, between four or five large blocks in between these R waves. And so if you know your large block method for, for heart rate determination, you know that the heart rate is somewhere between 60 and 75 beats a minute, uh, confirming the computer's calculation of 68 here. That's just a really good habit to get into. Now, if you learn to read heart rhythms in lead two, and there's certainly no shame in that, um, then, and you want to make sure that you understand what heart rhythm you're dealing with here, perfectly fine for you to look at lead two. So what you, what you need to do here is uh, look and say, okay, well, do we have P waves? Yes, we do. And are those P waves the same morphology, the same shape? Yes, they are. And do we have QRS complexes? And is there a one-to-one -one relationship between P waves and, and QRS complexes? And is there a constant PR interval? The answer to all of those questions uh, is yes. So we've met just about all of our criteria here for normal sinus rhythm. Um, you'll also notice that, by the way, we have upright P waves in lead one as well. Um, so these are all the criteria we look for on a 12 lead ECG uh, to let us know that we're dealing with a sinus rhythm. And in fact, the computerized interpretation says normal sinus rhythm. Now, um, I think it is helpful to have computerized uh, interpretation there. Some people do not think the computer is helpful. I do like to see what the computer has to say. I just think it's important to confirm it with your own eyes. So uh, we can put a check mark now next to rate and rhythm. So we have a sinus rhythm at a rate of 68. Let's move on to axis determination. And so what we're talking about is the heart's electrical axis in the so-called frontal plane. So take a look at this ECG. Oops, nope, sorry. First, um, just to kind of clarify what we're talking about here, we're referring to the heart's um, depolarization wavefront, or the so-called mean electrical vector. We know the heart is an electrical organ, and we know that it responds, it beats in response to an electrical signal that it itself generates. And so as this heart depolarizes and these millions of myocytes inside this myocardium depolarize, even though they're depolarizing in lots of different directions, if you average them and said, well, what is the main direction of this depolarization wavefront? You'll see here that it kind of depolarizes in a right shoulder to left leg direction as, you know, the example here is this large uh, block here in this diagram. And you'll notice that that is kind of the same as the polarity of lead two. So lead two is a dipole with the negative electrode on the right arm and the positive electrode on the left leg. So also lead two kind of goes in a right shoulder to left leg uh, direction. And this is one of the most important concepts in electrocardiography, namely that as a depolarization wavefront moves toward a positive electrode, we have an upright signal in that lead. Conversely, if a depolarization wavefront moves away from a positive electrode, you will get a negative signal in that lead. Or if that wavefront moves um, sort of perpendicular to a positive electrode, you will get a so-called equiphasic or isoelectric QRS complex that starts out positive as that wavefront approaches, but then ends up negative as that goes on by. So that example there in the lower right-hand corner shows what we would call an equiphasic or isoelectric, meaning an electrically neutral uh, QRS complex. So getting back to this normal ECG, if we're going to look at its axis, there's different ways that we can calculate this. Um, one of the easiest is the so-called quadrant method, and this method uses lead 1 and lead AVF. So you'll notice here that we have an upright QRS complex in lead 1, and we have an upright QRS complex in lead AVF. 
And because that is true, uh, we can prove that the heart's QRS axis is somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees, or what we would call a left inferior axis. So you, if you imagine someone standing in the anatomical position facing you with this shape right here superimposed on the, on the patient's chest, you would see that these, this depolarization wavefront is somewhere, again, in that right shoulder to left leg direction, or what we would call the, an inferior left axis, or a normal axis. We would call this the normal quadrant using leads 1 and AVF. Another thing that we can do is a speed method using leads 1, 2, and 3. So you'll notice here the QRS complex is upright in lead 1, it's upright in lead 2, and it's upright uh, in lead 3. Um, and so if you use a cheat sheet like this one, you can say, you know, I'm pretty certain that the QRS axis on this ECG is somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees. So that is the second speed method. So now you might be wondering, well, is it possible to, you know, we have a third, you know, a 360 degree uh, possibility here um, for determining the heart's axis. Can we get any closer than that? And the answer is yes. Kind of outside um, the parameters of today's video. But yes, it is uh, actually a relatively simple matter to calculate the QRS axis within 10 degrees, and that's very simple. We would just uh, take these first six leads here of the, of the 12 lead ECG, I'll blow them up for you, and ask yourself, what is the most equiphasic or isoelectric lead here, just looking at the QRS complexes? Well, you would say it is lead AVL. So the uh, R wave there is maybe about four millimeters high, and um, the S wave is maybe, I don't know, three and a half millimeters deep. So that's the closest we have to a so-called equiphasic or isoelectric QRS complex. So now we know that the heart's electrical axis is moving perpendicular to the positive electrode uh, that makes up lead AVL. And so which of these six leads is perpendicular to lead AVL in, in what is known as the hex axial reference system? Well, the easiest way to determine that is to just basically take the star of life and uh, think of this shape right here, so a star with six sides, turn it on its side, and then kind of replace that with arrows. And you will see now that lead two is perpendicular to lead AVL in the hex axial reference system. Um, leads one and AVF are perpendicular, and leads AVR and lead three are perpendicular. So we said that our equiphasic lead uh, was lead AVL, and so now we know that the perpendicular lead is lead 2, and because the polarity of the QRS complex in lead 2 is positive, we could look at the hex axial reference system, and we would know that the QRS axis in the frontal plane is about 60 degrees here. And if we look at the computerized interpretation of the QRS axis, we're at 55 degrees. So we've, we've pegged the QRS axis within 5 degrees here using the hex axial reference system. Now... You may be wondering, do I carry around a copy of the hex axial reference uh, system in my pocket? No, uh, of course not. If you've never read a 12 lead ECG before, or if you're brand new to cardiac axis determination, uh, that probably seems really, really scary. I assure you, it is really quite simple. Uh, this, it is very, very common to have the equiphasic lead to be lead AVL and to have the tallest lead or the perpendicular lead be lead two, and for your um, axis in the frontal plane to be close to 60 degrees. So that's very, very common. And when we do our video on axis determination, um, you'll see just how easy that can be. So that is the um, that is cardiac axis determination, at least in the so-called frontal plane. But of course, the heart is a three-dimensional object, uh, and we've only kind of like We've only really talked about the axis in the so-called frontal plane. What about the horizontal plane? Is there a way to calculate that axis? Well, there is, um, but instead of doing that, this is what I teach. So um, again, we calculate the QRS axis using the first six leads of the 12 lead ECG. Let's go over to the precordial leads, the leads that are actually physically placed on the patient's chest. What do we teach about these, especially in the normal 12 lead ECG? Well, um, in a normal ECG, the QRS complex should start out negative in lead V1, and it should end up positive in lead V6. 
somewhere in between lead V1 and lead V6, there should be a transition from negative to positive. So in this example, you can see V1 is negative, V2 is negative. Ah, there we are, equiphasic. This is our transition lead in lead V3, and then in lead V4, ah, now we're positive, and then V5, and then V6. So we start out negative in V1, we end up positive in V6, and our transition here is in lead uh, V3. Additionally, there should be a gradual increase in the amplitude of the R wave between leads V1 and V4. So here you see there's just a little nub of an R wave here in lead V1. It gets a little bit taller in lead V2, a little bit taller in lead V3, which is our transition lead, and then it reaches its uh, full height or maximum amplitude here in lead V4. Now, this is you know, highly dependent on accurate lead placement. And uh, we in medicine are not legendary for the accuracy of our lead placement. And even when there is poor R wave progression, it can be a nonspecific finding. But there are times when you're trying to do things like differentiate between early repole and acute anterior STEMI that your knowledge of R wave progression uh, can actually be your best friend. So this is an important thing to understand. So if we apply these rules... To this ECG, this normal ECG, um, our QRS complex indeed does start out negative in lead V1. It ends up positive in V6. Here is our equiphasic lead here in uh, lead V3, and we have a gradual increase in the amplitude of the R wave between leads V1 and V4. All of that uh, is perfectly normal. So that is kind of the crash course in axis determination, looking at both the uh, the frontal plane, which is the first six leads of the 12 lead ECG, and also the horizontal plane, which is the precordial leads, uh, leads V1 through V6. So let's go ahead and give ourselves a check mark next to axis determination, and we're going to go on to intervals. All right, PR, QRS, and QT. Now, you may have already noticed some of these things when we were looking at uh, rhythm analysis, but our PR interval starts at the beginning of the P wave and ends uh, at the very beginning of the QRS complex. We call it a PR interval and not a PQ interval simply because the Q wave is not always present. And the normal PR interval should be 120 to 200 milliseconds, which is three to five small blocks on the ECG paper. Um, the QRS complex uh, is measured just from just from the beginning, from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the S wave. So what is the duration of the QRS complex? Because if it is 120 milliseconds or three small blocks or larger, um, then we're going to have to explain that. That is a prolonged QRS complex, and we're going to have to look for things like a bundle branch block or paste rhythm or ventricular rhythm to help explain that. And then the QT interval. The QT interval is measured from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Now this measurement is kind of interesting in that it has to be normalized for heart rate. So at a heart rate of about 60, you're going to have a QT interval of about 400 milliseconds, which is two large block boxes. But as the heart rate speeds up, the QT interval kind of shortens, and as the heart rate slows down, it kind of widens, and we'll talk more about that as we uh, get started here. So um, if we look at this ECG here and we go to our computerized measurements and we start with the PR interval, it is measuring that PR interval at 186 milliseconds. Is that between 120 and 200? Yes. So this would be a normal PR interval. But again, let's go ahead and, and look at that with our own eyes. And as you can see here, the PR interval is indeed between three and five uh, small blocks. So so that is uh, probably a very accurate PR interval in this example. Okay, how about the QRS duration? The computer's measuring it here at about 86 milliseconds, which is just slightly more than two small blocks. Around 80 milliseconds is a perfectly, I mean, really normal adult QRS complex. Um, the vast majority of healthy people have a QRS complex, you know, give or take a few milliseconds there, around 80 milliseconds. And if we use our own eyes here again, we can see that indeed the QRS complex takes about a, two small blocks of ECG paper, which is about 80 milliseconds. Uh, so again, I believe the computer here. I think it is accurately measuring the QRS complex. Now, let's look at the QT interval. 
you'll notice we have two measurements here. It says QT and then it says QTC. So the raw QT interval is being measured at 368 milliseconds here. But what is the QTC? The QTC stands for corrected, either by Bizet's formula or some other formula to normalize or correct the QT interval for heart rate. Because, because again, if the heart rate speeds up as it does on the top here, the QT interval becomes shorter. But as the heart rate slows down, you see that QT interval start to widen out. So we have to be able to make apples to apples comparisons here because the patient's heart rate um, can be variable. Um, and so that is the corrected QT interval. Now, when we check this with our own eyes, we need to kind of use a rule of thumb here. So if you have a nice regular rhythm, as we do in this particular case, you can find the R to R interval and find the halfway point of the R to R interval, uh, which is about right here. And the preceding T wave should end before the halfway point of the R to R interval. And if that is the case, then that is our rule of thumb for saying it's probably not a prolonged QT interval. So if we go back and look at lead two in this particular case, and we find the R to R interval, and then we find the halfway point between the R to R interval, we can see that the T waves are indeed ending before the halfway point of the R to R interval, which lets us know that this is probably, uh, well, not probably, it is definitely not a prolonged QT interval. Some of you might say, well, what if it's a short QT interval? Okay, well, that is possible. Um, this is more of in like an intermediate level. This is like an overview. I'm not trying to make things too complicated today. Um, even though we're covering a lot of topics like axis determination that, that you may not be totally comfortable with yet, I'm just trying to give you a roadmap here so that you kind of understand a systematic approach to 12 lead ECG interpretation. And then this video will be a jumping point for us to do other videos to further explore some of these topics. Okay, so here the QTC is 391 milliseconds. Um, that is, uh, now, what, what would be a prolonged QT interval? Well, for men, they say it's about, it's above 450. For women, they say 460 milliseconds. Um, some would argue that it's not clinically significant so much until it's past maybe up 500 milliseconds. The worry would be that someone with a prolonged QT interval, especially if the presenting complaint with syncope, could potentially the patient have been in torsades or something like that, or could this uh, could the patient have long QT syndrome that could be a risk factor for sudden death? Um, that is the significance of the QT interval. Okay, getting back to the ECG here, um, we've looked at the rate and rhythm, sinus rhythm, rate of 68. Um, we've got a normal axis. We've proved that. We like our um, the precordial leads, our wave progression, everything like that, and our intervals all appear normal. So let's give ourselves another check mark and let's move on to morphology. Now, morphology, this is the step where, again, if you have a supraventricular rhythm with a wide QRS complex, this is where we would try and classify that as potentially a right or a left bundle branch block, or maybe a bifascicular block, or maybe a paced rhythm, something like that. In this case, though, um, all of our benchmarks are hitting normal because we're looking at a normal 12 lead ECG. But if we had a wide QRS complex, so if the QRS duration had been 120 milliseconds or more, then we would want to do something like in this case, the QRS complex, if you look up there at the computerized measurement, it says 146 milliseconds. Is that more than 120 milliseconds? Yes, uh, but it's a superventricular rhythm because we have sinus P waves. If you look at lead one here, you have nice upright P wave, QRS complex, and T wave. So when superventricular rhythms are wide, we would go to leads V1, and I use lead one, uh, we'll get into that when we do videos about right and left bundle branch block. But we would classify that as, like in this case, a right bundle branch block. Uh, or in this case, uh, we have a QRS duration of 160 milliseconds, but it's a superventricular rhythm, a left bundle branch block. This would be our opportunity to do that by looking at the morphology of the QRS complexes in leads V1 and in lead 1. You might also, during this phase, look at you know look for some more exotic conditions like Brugada syndrome that have a very specific 
type of coving, uh, ST segment elevation and incomplete right bundle branch block in lead V1, something like that. Just generally looking at this, the morphology that pops out at you with this ECG uh, to see if there's anything that uh, deserves further attention. This would be your designated step uh, to do that. But in today's ECG, which again, spoiler, spoiler alert, is a normal ECG, they, there's um, there's no right or left bundle branch block because the QRS duration is normal at 86 milliseconds. So let's give ourselves a check now at uh, morphology, and let's go on to STEMI mimics. We could talk about STEMI mimics all day because there is a huge list of conditions that can cause ST segment elevation on a 12 lead ECG. As a matter of fact, um, acute myocardial infarction is not even the most common cause of ST segment elevation amongst uh, chest pain patients. You know, that distinction belongs to left ventricular hypertrophy and the strain pattern, depending on what studies you look at, that you look at. And so all these different conditions, uh, we could do a separate video on all of these things. Like for today, though, let's just say early repolarization to give one example of what we might look at uh, during step five. So here we have an ECG of a uh, 20-year-old guy. Um, you'll notice acute MI suspected is at the top of this ECG. It's like, oh, okay, well, that gets my attention, especially when we have an ECG with nice data quality. If you keep reading here, it says ST elevation, consider anterolateral injury or acute infarct. Okay, so the computer thinks that there's anterior STEMI here. Again, though, there's only a 20-year-old guy not saying that it's impossible for him to be suffering an acute STEMI, but you have to consider, like, what is the reason for evaluation today, all right? And we'll get to that in the, in the very, in, in so-called step seven. Uh, but in this particular case, you'll notice that, we're, that the patient is in sinus bradycardia, very common for early repolarization. And if you look here in lead V4, we have really, really well-developed R waves, really good, uh, well-developed R wave progression, that is pretty normal for early repole. Um, we have these kind of classic notched J points here, and we have upwardly concave ST segment elevation or kind of smiley faced ST segment um, elevation here. That doesn't mean acute STEMI can't have upwardly concave ST elevation. I'm just saying a lot of times with early repole, classically speaking, the ST elevation will be upwardly concave which with notch J points. And you'll notice an absence of reciprocal changes here across this ECG. So stop, think about it, slow down, especially if the signs and symptoms are not really, really consistent with acute STEMI. This is probably nothing for you to worry about. This is probably the patient's normal ECG. In fact, this, this guy uh, was a recruit, I believe, uh, in the Marine Corps at Paris Island and was in excellent physical condition, only 20 years old. And the clinical story wasn't that great. Um, so we just want to kind of rule out the mimics of acute STEMI in step five. Uh, before we go on and look for acute myocardial infarction. So for STEMI mimics, even though there's plenty more that we could talk about, um, let's give ourselves a check mark in step five, and then we'll go on to uh, step six. Finally, at long last, we're going to look for ischemia, injury, and uh, acute infarct. Now, we know that today's ECG is normal, so we're not going to see anything like that, but this would be that step um, where we would look for things like ST segment elevation and reciprocal ST segment depression. Um, hopefully starting out with a good clinical story and a 12 lead ECG with excellent data quality. And we're interpreting the ECG in a very uh, systematic way to kind of keep us out of trouble, um, to help us identify some of these things that can cause ST segment elevation on the 12 lead ECG before we get to this step. This is just a roadmap, right? So if you go on the internet, you can find other systematic approaches to 12 lead ECG interpretation. This is just one that I happen to like. What's important is that you find a way that you like that appeals to you. Because as you become more experienced with 12 lead ECG interpretation, these things are going to happen automatically. I don't anymore think in my head that I'm going through these steps. I am hitting all of these steps. 
um, but it happens very automatically because you can see there's some redundancy here. You're going to pick up a prolonged PR interval when you're considering what heart rhythm that you're in. You might not wait until step three to pick that up, um, but this just gives you a roadmap to get from A to B uh, to C. But getting back to today's ECG, and if we look at this and say, well, is, are there any signs of coronary ischemia? No, none whatsoever. Uh, the ST segments are isoelectric, I mean, slightly elevated in uh, lead V2, but again, that is a lead with the deepest S wave there. Uh, so there's a reason the guidelines require a little bit more than one millimeter of ST segment elevation in lead V2. We'll get more into that when we talk about the male pattern. But this, um, you know, this is as close to a, a perfectly normal 12 lead ECG um, as you will ever find. In fact, a, a, an ECG wouldn't have to be this perfect even for me to call it a normal 12 lead ECG because there are millions and millions of people out there that have a normal 12 lead ECG. I would say this is a textbook normal 12 lead ECG. Um, but sometimes that, that's what people need to hear is that their ECG looks uh, normal. Um, so let's give ourselves a check mark. We've screened this for ischemia, injury, and infarct. Again, in the future, we're going to have lots and lots of videos about identifying, identifying coronary ischemia, um, acute STEMI, and things like that. So we'll go ahead and give ourselves a check mark. And uh, remember, remember step seven, correlate to the history and clinical presentation. The importance of this really can't be overstated um, because if the ECG you're looking at was acquired during training from a perfectly healthy recruit firefighter, something like that, um, then you know that it is the odds of it being a normal ECG are very, very high. So we refer to this as pretest probability. And when the pretest probability is low, the ECG evidence would have to be absolutely compelling for us to do something like activate the cardiac cath lab. Whereas if the pretest probability is high, because let's say the patient has really classic symptoms, looks acutely ill, is pale and diaphoretic, is having um, an uncomfortable squeezing or pressure in the center of their chest, but poorly localized and and, and left arm pain and, and feels nauseated, something like that. We would say then the pretest probability was high. And when the pretest probability is high, then we would take even subtle ECG signs more seriously. So, folks, that has been uh, the video on the six step method for 12 lead ECG interpretation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, feel free to leave me some comments and um, let me know what videos you would like to see. Thanks. Hope you have a great day.